Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Ruth just said they have some technical problems, so hopefully they will join soon. But uh, want to thank God for another Sabbath. I'm sure all of us feel so happy and blessed that Sabbath is here, especially in a time like this where life is so busy when life seems to take toll on everything that we do just to put everything aside and come together to praise God and relax itself is a great, great testimony of God's goodness in giving us this Sabbath so that we could rest and spend time with him. So this morning, I thank God for all of us who could join. Let's continue with our study. Let me share my screen. Can someone tell me that you're able to see my screen? Okay, somebody called Anand this thumbs up. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, the title of our series, the three-part series that I was uh, that I've done on Wednesday and Thursday, and the final one today is "Be Prepared, Jesus is Coming." Everybody, everybody is waiting for Jesus to come. All of us have the desire that Jesus come soon and take us home. While coming of Jesus is not determined by my. Uh, actions in any way he has got his own time he knows exactly when he should come when but the first part is in our hands be prepared you cannot control the coming of jesus he would definitely come he will come in his own way in his own time but the first part be prepared is in your hands and my hands if the coming of jesus have to be a reality to you in terms of experiencing not just to see him, but to be with him, the first part of this theme is important. You have to be prepared. So we must remember that as much as you say, oh, I wish Jesus come soon and take us home. Be remember, if you are not ready, like the five foolish virgins, half ready, half not ready, you it doesn't work. So I want you to intentionally, mark this word, intentionally, Prepare yourself to meet God. That is very important to each one of us. Also, uh, the first part, we saw the, our heavenly journey, how Jesus would come, the manner of his coming, how deceptions take place, how, he would, how we would travel to heaven, and uh, how long does it take, and uh, how many worlds uh, uh, we uh, cross over to get to heaven. We also spoke about how Jesus receives us into heaven. And on Thursday, we spoke about our heavenly home, how our heavenly home looks, the Garden of Eden, how Jesus receives us there, and how two Adams meet. And then we also spoke about the city of Jerusalem, how big it is, and all the mansions that God has prepared for each one of us that we be able, able to live with him for eternity. And we also spoke about where our final home will be. That will be when the thousand years are over, the great city of Jerusalem would come down. And ultimately this earth that God has created in the beginning to be our home will be our eternal home as well. And Jesus himself, God himself will make his dwelling with us and be with us. So today will be the part three our heavenly lifestyle. Now, throughout history, there has been um, speculations how heaven will be. I remember when I was studying at Spicer uh, long back, uh, some of my friends and we would say, how, I'm sure heaven might be a boring place. <laughs> we remember some of our young, we young being young, we say, well, we, we, we will not have 
girls there whom we can make friendships with there won't there won't be marriages there won't be this there we can't play cricket and there we can't fool around there we can't do this we can't do that all these things used to go in our minds and uh, the conclusion would be well except seeing jesus the rest all is a boring thing what else is there to do nothing nothing no fun and uh, no mischievousness and life without fun is such a boring thing and then we also used to wonder what we, what is allowed there what is so many speculations we used to make and what uh, if suppose i'm not a farmer and i don't know how to do farming i don't want to grow fruits and i don't want so what will i do so you could imagine all sorts of speculations all sorts of imaginations of how life would be in heaven what would i be doing for eternity what is there to do for eternity how so all these things we used to these things used to go in our mind and we used to wonder what kind of maybe today in today's generation you could say that you know there's no internet there there's no movies there there's no this there's no that so what's fun what kind of fun would be there in heaven so i'm sure we might be thinking of, of things like this so before i could explain how the life in heaven would be there's something that we want to get it right and we want to get it clear in our head that's what the scripture says stop speculations god has not revealed all look at first corinthians 129 but as it is written i has not seen nor hear ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which god has prepared for those who love him what what is uh, paul saying when we think of heaven when we think of our heavenly home no i has ever seen nor was it told or they had ever heard nor has it even entered into the heart of that means it can't even enter into your imaginations you can't even comprehend even in your imagination even in other words we say even in your wildest dreams you don't even you can't even comprehend what the things which god has prepared for those who love him i want you to understand this text in the first place itself before i proceed towards our study today it is it is very clear no eye nor an ear not even a heart can comprehend what great things the lord has prepared for us so we are not to speculate more than what is revealed get that statement we are not to speculate more than what is revealed talking on this same thing look at what sister white says it is presumptuous to indulge in suppositions and theories regarding matters that god has not made known to us in his word it is presumptuous to indulge in suppositions and theories regarding matters that god has not made known to us in his word we need not enter into speculations regarding our future state she says don't contemplate too much on your future state what is necessary god has revealed the scripture says no eye no ear not even a heart can comprehend what god has prepared for us she also says workers for god should not spend time speculating as to what conditions will prevail in the new earth it is presumptions to indulge in suppositions and theories regarding matters that god has not revealed he has made every provision for our happiness in the future life and we are not to speculate regarding his plans for us what is important to for me to know right now is everything that is needed to make my life happy in the future life he has already prepared now what that happiness eternity will reveal i can only think of how what happiness i want when i think of my life on this earth i don't want to fall sick i don't want to get into trouble i don't want anybody to annoy me i don't want anyone to step on my toes i don't want anyone to hurt me i don't want to have financial problems i don't want to have any relationship problems i don't want any troubles with my children 
I want happiness, I want peace, I want prosperity. This is how a human mind thinks when we think of life on this earth. So through God, God through the pen of inspiration has revealed to us that everything that is necessary for our happiness in the life after or in the future life, God has already prepared. But the details of it is not revealed. So therefore, do not spend speculating, especially to the workers of God, she says, do not spend too much time on speculating. Sometimes people would ask, oh, what kind of clothes will I wear? What kind of hair will I have? What kind of this? What kind of that? Go, what God has not revealed, don't speculate too much. And if people were to ask you, just let them know that what is necessary for your happiness, everything is in place. And then stick to things that have been revealed so that because what is revealed is good enough to understand those things that has not been revealed or to live in anticipation of those things that would yet that were to come to make your life and my, my life happy. Another statement she makes is matters of vital importance have been plainly revealed in the word of God, which means what is necessary for your salvation, for your happiness, the overall uh, necessary things God has already revealed. These subjects are worthy of our deepest thought. So what is revealed is where you need to spend most of your time contemplating and aspiring to be a part of such a life. But we are not to search into matters on which God has been silent. If God himself choose not to reveal, let us not speculate too much into that one. We are not gods. Some have put forth the speculation that the redeemed will not have gray hair. Look at her during her lifetime. People started saying all sorts of things. Oh, in heaven, there will be no gray hair. Who said? Did God say? Did the word of God say that? Is that the matter of importance, whether you have gray hair or no gray hair? And she says, some have put forth the speculation that the redeemed will not have gray hair. Other foolish suppositions have been put forward as though these were matters of importance. Does it really matter whether you have gray hair or uh, uh, not gray hair? Is that what is so important when we get to heaven? Well, on earth, yes. We spend too much time, too much money, too much everything to make sure that we have a good hair and maybe makeup and all those things. But in order to compare the life of heaven with the life that is you have now, with the mind that you have now, is foolishness. Because no eye, no ear, no heart can comprehend what God has prepared for us. One thing I'm clear, what I, what I want according to what God wants me to have in heaven, is already prepared. On this earth, whatever the joy I feel is what, what makes me happy and joyful on this earth, I feel I want to have, is also comes with a part of uh, pain and sorrow included in it, embedded in it. But in heaven, those things will not be there. Eternal joy, eternal peace, eternal happiness. So that is very important. So may God help his people to think rationally. When questions arise upon which are uncertain, we should ask what say the scriptures. She herself is saying, whenever you have some questions or some speculations you want to make, the first place to approach is God's word. Is it in the Bible? Has God revealed it in his word? And if he has revealed it, Let's think of them. If he has not revealed it, let's wait in hope and anticipation that what is not revealed and what we want to know is much more glorious, much more happier, much more gracious and peaceful than what we could even imagine with this human sinful limited mind on this part of the life. So let's not speculate too much. On having said that, let's see what are things, what kind of lifestyle we will be there. One thing is for sure, the word of God reveals that there is no disease or death in heaven. Scriptures is full of this uh, statements where it says, um, I of, eyes of the blind shall be opened, ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, lame will leap like as a heart, tongue of the blind shall sing, God will wipe away all tears. 
if there's one thing that should be make that should make us joyful happy is to know that none of these things will exist in heaven what can you imagine that kind of a lifestyle where all the diseases all the death and all the pain that comes with sin will be completely eradicated they can neither even come into your thoughts or minds or even touch you that itself should give you a hope what kind of lifestyle we will have when we get to heaven it's no more death no more sorrow no more crying or pain when we that's the kind of life we will have when we are heaven and uh, uh, when it comes to children um look at uh, the, it says uh, isaiah chapter 11 verse 6 to 9 the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb the leopard shall lie down with the young goat the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them the cow and the bear shall graze their young one shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth shall put shall be full of the knowledge of the lord as the waters cover the sea imagine nowadays our children are deprived of this natural playground that god has prepared from the foundation of the world now nowadays most of these animals you see in a zoo some of our countries we don't even have zoos where we can see all these animals you have to pay money to go there you have to stay in a protected area in a distance afar to be able to have a view of this certain of the animals but in the heaven made new you could imagine our children the children and even us as adults how happy it would be to spend time with god's creation god's creation itself will be a playground for everyone in our human in our human children language it's like a playground where children will have all the joy that is needed nowadays i don't know in india much but uh, here in england and other places i feel so sorry for our children they are so much hooked to this internet they are always on the phone or a tablet or a computer playing games physical activity is lessened their mind cap- capabilities are lessened their social life has become so bad i mean i just it's, i feel so sorry for children growing right now but in heaven that will not be there if you look at the description in isaiah what an amazing scene that would be for children to be there the beasts will not hurt nor destroy the wolf leopard and lion will be led by a little child the scripture says imagine sitting with jesus in the garden of eden in the holy city in the earth made new and uh, you know able to god explain god explaining the nature playing with all the things that god has prepared imagine children having wonderful time in the nature understanding and you know growing their capabilities what is an amazing experience that would be and if they have any doubts that they would want to un- understand jesus himself will be our master teacher explaining things that no human eye or heart or no ear can even think of understanding not only that there is eternal joy and health as i said no more death no more sickness it is one thing not to fall sick or not to die but it is another thing to live and to be happy and joyful you now some people may be not be sick but they are, they lead a miserable life no happiness no joy but heaven is full of life that is joyful and happy there is no sickness can you imagine what the scripture says in heaven there is no um there is no sick the inhabitant shall not say i am sick the desert shall blossom as a rose violence shall no more be heard in the land this is so so important that this this text brings soothing to my soul we are so scared sometimes to go out we are not sure what would happen who would come in what mindset and kill and destroy in my own church here this year we have lost three young boys murder teenagers not not because of any fault of theirs here in london right in my own churches three murders took place mothers are crying painful experience 
can't even imagine. One mother is the, he's the only child. Somebody's problems have costed his own life. In heaven, violence shall no more be heard, even in the land. Forget about even doing it. You won't even hear of violence. The former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. There are certain experiences on this earth that when we think of them, when they come to our mind, it really hurts us. It really bothers us. It really, in, in our in our day-to-day -day language, it, it, it rises your BP, it agitates you. But in heaven, nothing of that sort will be there. What a joy that would be. Jesus himself will be with us. And then what a joy that itself is. And then what else is there? In heaven, there's praise and worship in heaven. I always say that I will lose my job when I get to heaven. No pastor will have a job. Who do I preach to? There is no finer herald group there where I can call them and preach to. There is no church to pastor. But there is something that is there that all of us engage. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, Isaiah 66, 23 says, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Can you imagine what a grand day that would be? That every new moon day and that every Sabbath, all flesh, all flesh will come to worship God. What a joyful experience that would be to be able to praise God right in his own presence. I don't know who drew this picture, but just looking at this picture, God sitting on his throne, angels surrounding him, and thousands and thousands and th maybe millions and billions of saved ones every new moon and every Sabbath gathering around the throne to praise and adore and worship God. Can you imagine what a joyful event that would be? Talking of this grand experience, Ellen White says, there will be music there. The song, such music and songs as save in the visions of God, no mortal ear has heard or mind conceived. Can you imagine? Can you, can you imagine the kind of music that we would hear in heaven? The kind of singing that we would hear in heaven? You know, when, when uh, I went to GC, and when, on a Sabbath day, there were around GC's general conference uh, of our church. On a Sabbath day, there were more than 70 to 80,000 people in one place, dressed well in different costumes, representing different countries, and with all kinds of talents of singing and praising. When I participated in that worship on that Sabbath that I was there, looking at 70 to 80,000 people, all with one accord, all with one purpose, praising God. I got goosebumps, you know, I couldn't believe what a joyful experience that is. So I, I can imagine, I'm just trying to imagine if an earthly sight of such a thing has brought so much joy to my heart to come together, people of all races, people of all color, people of all nations under one umbrella to sing and praise God. Imagine in heaven, imagine in heaven, you see the face of God himself, you see the heavenly hosts, you see the glory of God, you see the all people of all times, not just our time, people of all ages coming together with no sin, no stain, with the joy of praising God. What a glorious scene that would be, what a glorious experience that would be, that in heaven we would be able to, what did Ellen White say? No mortal ear has heard or mind conceived of what kind of a praise and worship will be there when we get to heaven. Can you? I, I can't even imagine with my human mind. That's the kind of God we have. She also says, the songs which the ransomed ones will sing, the song of their experience. You know, most of the songs that we sing today are the experiences or the lyrics that were written by some people out of their own experience or out of their own imaginations. But you know, when we get to heaven, the songs bubble out of your life, the songs come out of the inspiration of your own experience. You know, can you imagine you, spring, you sing to God out of your own experience? 
anybody that writes a song out of their own experiences and sings that song is the most so the song is the is the song that is most closest to their heart because it was born out of their own experiences so in heaven the songs which the ransomed ones will sing what are they they are the songs of your own experiences when you see the face of god what comes to your mind is his goodness his graciousness his mercy his everlasting love that just spills out of your mouth in the form of a song and nobody can control you nobody can contain you because your joy is so great that you keep uttering all god's goodness in the form of singing and one of that is great and marvelous are thy works o lord god the almighty righteous and true are thy ways thou king of the ages who shall not fear o lord and glorify thy name for thou art only art holy like how we have this in revelation these kind of songs born out of our own experiences will be the songs and music that comes and being played and you could imagine the heavenly choir you know there are certain choirs that you would love to sing you can sit and sing for hours because the way you see them sing sing so melodiously and harmonically but in heaven you can't even imagine what kind of music and kind of choir is there to sing and to bring glory and honor to god i can't wait to get there to be a part of this grand celebration of praise and worship new moon after new moon sabbath after sabbath in heavenly home there will be eternal joy and happiness wherever you walk in the earth made new in the city jerusalem all that you see is peace tranquility harmony joy happiness no pain no sorrow could you imagine i don't know who drew this picture but just looking at the picture just try to contemplate look at the look look how peaceful it looks look how serene it looks it's an it it is just a reminder that the great things that the lord has prepared for us when we get to heaven what else what else happens will will people recognize each other in heaven or will we lose our identity when we get to heaven what does first corinthians 13 12 say what does it say it says then shall i know even as also i am known that means whatever we know here we will be able to identify there um uh, 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 look at what sister white says in uh, last day events book identity of the redeemed is preserved the resurrection of jesus was a type of the final resurrection of all who sleep in him so if you were to understand how life in heaven how the the so resurrection of the god's people would be she says look into the resurrection of jesus and his life then it makes easy for you to understand what does it how do we know the countenance of the risen savior his manner his speech were all familiar to his disciples so when jesus rose from the grave on that sunday morning did jesus disciples recognize him did they recognize his speech did they did they were they able to see him clearly yeah so as jesus rose from the dead those who sleep in him are to rise again we shall know our friends even as the disciples knew jesus their friend they may have been deformed diseased or disfigured in this mortal life and they rise in perfect health and symmetry yet in the glorified body their identity will be perfectly preserved so when we died maybe some of us die with sickness with disease with disfigured bodies but when we are rose to life when we are resurrected to life we resurrect in perfect health and symmetry yet in that glorified body our identity is still preserved our identity is still preserved mohan will be mohan i'm not going to take a new identity i'm not going to look something else than what god has created me and what i look now god but all the deformities that sin has brought on my identity that will be taken away but not my identity itself the same sorry the same form will come forth what does he say the same form will come forth but it will be free from disease and every defect defect it it lives again bearing the same individuality of features imagine this 
it lives again with the same features that you have so that friends will recognize friends. Imagine if your form is changed, if your figure is changed, it's very difficult. Sometimes people, if you see a person after 30 years, if you, if you have met somebody as a friend in teenage years and you meet them after so many years, sometimes you, are, you find it difficult to even identify. Why? Because the figure is changed. The features are changed. You become so uh, fat or round or whatever, unidentifiable. But in heaven, when we get to our, uh, when God brings us to life on the resurrection day, though if we are dead or if we are alive, what goes out is we will be free from disease and every defect, but our identity remains. There we shall know even as also we are known. There the loves and sympathies that God has planted in the soul will find the truest and sweetest exercise. So what is it? Family, and not only that we will know each other, the families also will be united. It says, we see a retina of angels on either side of the gate. And as we pass in, Jesus speaks, come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom that is prepared for you. From when? From the foundation of the world. Here we, he tells you to be a partaker of his joy. And what is that? It is the joy of seeing of the travail of your soul. Fathers, it is the joy of seeing that your efforts, mothers are rewarded. Here are your children. The crown of life is upon their heads. So in other words, you'll be able to see the joy of seeing who? Your children in heaven. Fathers, here are your children. Mothers, here are your children. Isn't that a grand, grand, joyful reunion and great experience to be able to meet the joy of your life, the love of your life, your children. What an amazing experience that would be. God, sorry, God's greatest gift is Christ whose life is ours given to us. He died, for, he died for us and was raised for us that we might come forth from the tomb to a glorious companionship with heavenly angels to meet our loved ones and to recognize their faces for the Christ likeness does not destroy our image. Understand this statement. For the Christ likeness does not destroy our image but transforms it into his glorious image. Every saint connected in family relationships here will know each other there. You will be able to identify every family member that you know of while you live on this earth. But uh, one thing we must be very sure is what? Our dispositions unchanged. While our sinful bodies, our defects in our image are changed, there won't be something that doesn't change, which, mu which must change here if you were to make it to heaven and be there with that glorious body. What is it? Look at this. If you would be a saint in heaven, you must first be a saint on earth. The traits of character you cherish in life will not be changed by death or by resurrection. Now, this is the key I want you to know. What, uh, as we began this series, I asked you in the, on Wednesday, what is one thing that you can carry to heaven? And most of you said, it is your character. So what, what are we saying? If there's one thing that will not change in your resurrection, in your heavenly life, is your character. With what kind of character you went into your grave, that with, with, with that you will come back, you will come to life and that remains with you which means the characters have to be formed now. If, if my body is weak, if I have a feeble body, if I, have, if I only lived with one hand, with one eye, with one leg, with one kidney, or whatever it could be, in resurrection, everything will be given back to what God created. But one thing that God will not change, one thing that God will not put in is a character that is changed. That have to be done on this side of the world. That's what it means. So you will come up from the grave with the same disposition you manifested in your home and in society. Jesus does not change the character at his coming. Get this. That will not be changed. The work of transformation must be done now. Our daily lives are determining our destiny. Every day, the choices you make, the habits you form is determining where your destiny is. 
defects of character must be repented of and overcome through the grace of Christ and a symmetrical character must be formed while in this probationary state that we may be fitted for the mansions above so don't ever think well i'm a smoker now when jesus christ comes he will save me i don't have to smoke he will change me in a twinkling of an eye i will be changed from mortal to immortal this corruption will put on incorruption please let's not fantasize such kind of life if your character were to be perfect in heaven we must first made it make it perfect right here the character the, the traits the habits must be changed while we i am still alive on this earth so that when christ raises me from death if i were to die before he comes what he raises me is my life and what he changes is my deformed body but not my character so that determines on which side you will be when christ comes what about little children many there will be so many little children whose parents may not make it to heaven there are so many little children that might have died and for no reason of their fault maybe due to sickness maybe due to malnutrition you know so many thousands of children die every day around the world because of malnutrition because of uh, unhygienic uh, birth and so many other things would god not save them what will happen to them they are not sinful people look at this as the little infants come forth mortal from their dusty beds they immediately wing their way to their mother's arms they meet again never more to part but many of the little ones have no mother there we listen to wain for the rapturous song of triumph from the mother the angels receive the motherless infants and conduct them to the tree of life it is so unfortunate as a human you that's what we think but it will not be so when we think of the life eternal those children who have no parents who cannot be guided to their parents in resurrection uh, the pen of inspiration says the angels their guardian angels will continue to nurture them until they grow to the stature that god intended for them they will guide them to the tree of life to give them the fruit as a symbol of life eternity so the and what about uh, imbeciles you know the word imbeciles have a different meaning right now from the time that ellen white wrote uh, in today when you talk of imbeciles you think a stupid person or a foolish person but uh, you know english language every few uh, 100 years or every few uh, um, uh, um, tens of years sometimes the meaning changes so when ellen white wrote this uh, this word imbeciles during her time imbeciles means imbeciles it meant at those uh, during her lifetime children uh, uh, or people born with mental deformities that they cannot think clearly for themselves she is thinking of such people maybe like what we call autistic children or people with down syndrome or what i'm not sure but people who cannot rationalize like how you and me normally rationalize what happens to such people it is not their fault will god not save them will not god be merciful to them look at what god has revealed through ellen white the grace of god will remove all this hereditary transmitted imbecility and he will have an inheritance among the saints in light god will give them an inheritance to you the lord has given reason a child she speaking of an experience a is a child as far as the capacity of reason is concerned but he has the submission and obedience of a child that means people might have been grown big they may be 40 50 but their mind is like a child because of the imbalance or the growth defects of their mind and body god in his mercy would rescue them would save them and will have will give them an inheritance among all the others whom god will be saved what a joyful experience that would be so if there's any parent who is suffering with sign of sign kind with such kind of a children like autistic or down syndrome people who are not able to think for themselves who doesn't reason out things to not know what is good what is bad you know take heart that when christ comes those children those adults will have a space place in god's kingdom where those defects will be removed in the resurrection and there will be joy and happiness i like this one very much look at especially mothers 
to the women I'm talking right now. There is a special tribute to faithful mothers. God has revealed through pen of inspiration. When the judgment shall sit and the book shall be opened, when the well done of the great judge is pronounced and the crown of immortal glory is placed upon the brow of the victor, many will rise their, raise their crowns in sight of the assembled universe and pointing to their mother, say, she made me all I am through the grace of God. Her instruction, her prayers have been blessed to my eternal salvation. The angels of God immortalize the names of the mothers whose efforts have won their children to Christ Jesus. Mothers, it is so unfortunate nowadays, mothers are also relinquishing their responsibility to care for their children. I'm not talking about all the mothers, some. We are so busy pursuing a career. We are so busy trying to climb the ladder of success that sometimes we neglect our children. We don't have time for our children. And something, well, it's father is the priest of the home. Let the father do it. Mothers, God has placed a special responsibility on you. Ellen White has seen in her vision that when we get to heaven, so many men, so many girls, maybe, would when they see that they're in heaven, their first thought that comes to is their mother. That's what she says. They raise their crowns, look at their mother and say, she is the one who is the reason for me coming here. She sacrificed her career. She sacrificed her happiness. She sacrificed her comforts. She sacrificed everything to make sure that I'm safe, that I knew the truth, that I was well taken care, that my needs are met. The selfless love of a mother is, has a great tribute to receive when we get to heaven. So mother, the greatest responsibility that you can ever have upon this earth is to train your children, to spend time with your children, teach them the way of the Lord. Because the rewards are greater in heaven than the rewards that you could think of right here on this earth. What about the rewards for those who serve God? Look at what it says, and, and, at, the, and at the same time, uh, sorry, and at that time, some will come to you and will say, that means when we are in heaven, some people will come and say, what? If it had not been for the words you spoke to me in kindness, if it had not been for your tears and supplications and earnest efforts, I should never have seen the king in his beauty. What a reward is this? How significant is the praise of human beings? How insignificant is the praise of human beings in this earthly transient life in comparison with the infinite rewards that await the faithful in the future immortal life? Words of encouragement to self-supporting workers. In other words, Alan White is saying, when we get to heaven, there are people that come to you and say, wow, I am here, I want to thank you for sharing God's word with me. I want to thank you for inviting me to that finer her herald. I want to thank you for preaching that sermon in that series. I want to thank you for clarifying these doubts when I attended that seminar. I want to thank you for sharing that word of God in those campaign in that evangelistic series. I want to thank you for taking time week after week to, to open God's word and teach me the values of truth. My dear friends, we are not just called to listen to God's word. We are called to share it because that's the only way you touch the life of other people. And when we get to heaven, they will come to you and tell you how grateful they are. They will tell Jesus himself, you know what? I knew the truth because of this series, because of these sermons, because of this person who has opened your word with me. On this earth, nobody may appreciate you. All your life you may be serving, you may be sharing, but you don't see any fruits. You don't see anybody even appreciate. Don't you worry. Because Ellen White says, what a reward is this? How insignificant is the praise of humans? When you come to worship God, when you share God's words with them, don't expect for human praises. If they appreciate it, thank God for it. But if they choose not to appreciate it, leave it. Because even if man may forget, Heaven is recording every good deed. And when you get there, everything will be rewarded. Every kind word spoken, every prayer that is offered has a reward in heaven. And what a joy it is to receive praises and rewards from Jesus 
rather than sinful human lips. Sometimes our praises on this earth are so superficial, it won't be in heaven. So take heart that nothing will be forgotten of the work that you do to Christ to win souls. When the redeemed stand before God, precious souls will respond to their names who are there because of a faithful, patient efforts put forth in their behalf, the entreaties and earnest persuasions to flee to the stronghold. Those, thus, those who in this world have been laborers together with God will receive their reward. So be faithful to God in serving, no matter whether you receive any gift or reward here or not, because God has prepared those res uh, rewards for us. What about, what do we do? What is heavenly occupations? That's our title anyway. What's the lifestyle? What are we going to do in heaven? Isn't it boring to not to do anything? And, and so what does scripture say? And uh, through Ellen White, God has also revealed, in the earth made new, the redeemed will engage in the occupations and pleasures that brought happiness to Adam and Eve in the beginning. The Eden life will be lived, the life in garden and field. Do you know something? When Adam and Eve were created, God, even before sin came in, God gave them work. Don't think that work was given to Adam and Eve after they sinned. No, God gave them work even before they sinned. He said, be fruitful and multiply before sin was given. And he said, yeah, I, you have to till the garden, dress the garden, take care. Take care means you are to do something. That was there even before sin came. How did, what kind of work they did before sin came? I don't know. I'm not speculating. But they were engaged in labor. So also, if there was work before sin came, there will be work after sin is eradicated. For eternity, we will engage ourselves in what kind of that? Occupations and pleasures. The work that brings joy to happiness. The work that brought joy to Adam and Eve before sin will be the kind of work that will bring joy and happiness to our lives when we are in heaven. Look at what it says, man's height and vigor. In heaven, all come forth from their graves, the same in stature as when they entered the tomb. That means how tall you were, five, five and a half, six feet, whatever you were when you died, that's the height that you will have when you come to life. But Adam, who stands among the risen throng, is of lofty height and majestic form in stature, but little below the Son of God. So the tallest man, in other simple languages, the tallest man that you would ever see in that ransomed, saved group would be who? Adam, because Ellen White says she saw, you know, he, is the, he, is the, uh, he is the tallest. But how tall was he? It says he presents... Uh, how tall was he? In stature, he's tall, so tall, but in stature, he was little below the Son of God. Maybe he could be up to the shoulders of Son of God, that is Jesus. He presents a marked contrast to the people of later generation. In this one respect is shown the great degeneracy of the race, but all arise with the freshness and vigor of eternal youth. Restored to the tree of life in the lost long lost Eden, the redeemed will grow up to the full stature of a race in its primeval glory. That means when God leads us to the tree of life and when we eat the fruit as a symbol of no life, but, the, but, but no death, but life eternal, that we will grow to the stature that God intended all of us to grow in, his, in the first place. That means we would all reach the stature of Adam. We will all reach the stature of Adam that God has created. And how tall was Adam? He was as uh, so tall, taller than everyone, but little lesser than Jesus. As Adam came forth from the hand of his creator, he was of noble height and of beautiful symmetry. He was more than that he was more than twice as tall as men now living upon the earth. In other words, how tall was Adam? Ellen White was shown he was twice the height of a normal or average person's height today. Well, it depends on the place that we come from. If it is India, slightly our height is little uh, shorter than some other, some, or the black rays or the white rays. No, the average height in India could be five and a half feet. Not everybody are six feet. 
I'm not sure, but if we take five and a half feet as a average height, the twice that twice that height would be 11 feet. So at least Adam is 11 feet tall. And if you were to take the average height of a black person, they're basically tall, they're six foot and some of the other um, Mongolian groups. So what do you think? Some, some of the other Caucasian groups, I mean, sorry. So if six feet is an average height, you could imagine Adam being 12 foot tall. Can you imagine what that meant? Not only his height is uh, that, but look at his body. It says it's a beautiful symmetry. His features were perfect and beautiful. You know, some of us worry so much about our figure, our body. Oh, I'm getting, I have a tummy. I want six pack. Oh, there's fold here. There's fold there. And some women are worried about how they look. Your bone children, your body has disfigured. Some of us spend hundreds and thousands of rupees trying to cover up things, trying to look better, trying to wear clothes that will not show those folds, trying to cover up those marks that have been born out of birth, of giving children birth and other things. How many things? One of the biggest industry on earth right now is the cosmetic industry. Billions and billions and billions of dollars, pounds and rupees and money are poured into it. People may have food to eat or not, but they cannot survive without a makeup or without doing something that makes them look good or covering up certain things so that they look, they think that they look beautiful. That's the kind of life that we sometimes we lead on this earth. But when God raises us to life eternal, it says perfect symmetry how God created in the beginning, that's how it will be. No more folds, no more wrinkles, no more hangings, whatever you think uh, is how you look. That's how you come, you, that's what God is going to make. His complexion will neither, neither white nor shallow, but ruddy glowing with the rich tint of health. What does ruddy mean? As I said, certain things, when God, was, God has shown to his people through visions and dreams, they could not find a human language to tell what that meant. It just, they understood and wrote what they felt that is. We don't know how that means, what that means, but that's how all of our complexion will be different. Even uh, Eve was not quite as tall as Adam. In other words, if Adam was 12 feet tall and Ellen White's vision she saw, Eve was not as tall as him. Her head reached a little above his shoulders. That means maybe she was a, a foot lesser, uh, 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 shorter than Adam, which means if Adam would be 12, she would be 11. If he, was, he would be 11 feet, she would be 10 feet. Can you imagine what a height that would be to be? And then what else, what else was she? She was noble and perfect in symmetry and very beautiful woman. If you are having inferior complexity because of how you look, do not worry. You will have your perfect body or in other common language, perfect figure, perfect symmetry and your beauty cannot match with anything because God is going to bring you to that kind of, uh, uh, that, that kind of life when, we, when God brings us back to our life. So look at Adam's strength. How, how strong was Adam when he was created? It says, if Adam at his creation had not been endowed with 20 times as much vital fo force as men are now have, the race with their present habits of living in violation of the natural law would have become extinct. You know what that means? How, how strong was Adam when he was created? He was 20 times stronger than the strongest man that ever lived on the face of the earth right now or that ever lives. Because Adam was made such a strong person as the generations passed to where we are now with the living habits and the violation of the laws God has given us, we are still able to survive because we have not degenerated greatly. In other words, if Adam was only as strong as a human being is today, the strongest human being today, by now the human race would have become extinct because the way the human strength has degenerated all these generations, 
we would not be living today. But because he was endowed with 20 times the strength of the strongest man right now, we are able to still come. Look at our own generation, our own great grandparents and grandparents. They ate some good food, you know, and the lifestyle they had living among the nature, breathing that fresh air, not eating that processed food, instant foods. They lived. Their eyesight was good. Even in their 90s, they walked around. They did not know what, uh, what diabetes was, neither what cancer is, not all these things. But look at in the matter of 50, 60, 70 years, how degenerated we are. Some of us can't even run in our 30s and 40s. Some of us don't even want to work for one hour in our gardens. We have become so weak. Mentally, we think we are smart, but physically we have grown so weak. Our bodies have become so weak. These bodies still exist because God has endowed Adam with 20 times the strength of today's man so that as this degeneration took place, at least still there is some kind of a strength in us. Had God not given Adam that strength at that time, Ellen I. White says, we would have become extinct today. What about order in the new, new heaven and life, uh, 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 new earth? God is a God of order. Everything connected with heaven is in perfect order. Subjections and thorough discipline marks the movements of the angelic host. Success can only attend order and harmony section. In other words, the heavenly lifestyle will be in perfect order, not like a disarray on this earth. Families experiencing chaos. There is no order among life. There is no order among families. Everybody do what they feel is right. Everybody are traveling in their own direction. But in the heaven made new, our lifestyle will have a perfect order. There is full equality, which means the selfish principles exercised on the earth are not the principles which will prevail in heaven. All men stand on an equality in heaven. Praise God. This makes me so happy. What a kind of discrimination on this earth. How, how, what kind of discriminations we have. If it is color discrimination, it is caste discrimination, it is race discrimination. I, I, in India, if it is among Telugu people, it is caste problem. It is a language problem. If it is among Indians, it is a, it is a state problem. Oh, you're a Malayali. I am a Telugu. What, you, I know some of us are so stupid. We fight over our race. We fight over our color. We fight over our language. We feel we are superior. We are superior. I remember Dr. Cherin used to say, in heaven, we will only speak Malayalam, I believe. Well, as me as a Telugu, I would say, we'll only speak Telugu there. Is this what is all about? If it is said in a fun way, yes, we understand. But in heaven, everybody will be equal. Everything, what a joy that would be. Nobody will say I'm superior. I look fairer than you. I look taller than you. I am higher than you. I earn more than you. I am better than you. Praise God. Such inequality will not be there in our heavenly lifestyle. What about our social life? There we shall know even as also we are known. There the loves and sympathies that God has planted in the soul will find the truest and sweetest exercise. The pure communion with the holy beings, the harmonious social life with the blessed angels and with the faithful ones of all ages, the sacred fellowship will bind us together. The whole family in heaven and earth are among the experience of the hereafter. In heaven, there's only one family. It is not Telugu family, Tamil family, Malayalam family, or a Hindi family, nothing of that sort, or Canada family. The whole world will be one family. What a joy. You won't even feel the discrimination, neither will you feel any difference. That's, that is something that I long to see. What about marriages in heaven? What did Jesus say in Matthew 22, 30? Jesus lifted the veil from the future life. In the resurrection, he said, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. No marriages in heaven. There are men today <clears throat> who express their belief that there will be marriages and births in the earth, in the new earth. But those who believe the scriptures cannot accept, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> cannot accept such doctrine. The doctrines that children will be born in a new earth is not a part of the sure word of God, which means in heaven there are no marriages and there are no births in heaven. <clears throat> um, fellowship with angels and the faithful of all ages. So 
<coughs> sorry <coughs> every redeemed one will understand the ministry of angels in his own life the angel who was his guardian from his earliest moment the angel who watched his steps and covered his head in the day of peril the angel who was with him in the valley of the shadow of death who marked his resting place who was the first to greet him in the resurrection morning what will it be to behold converse with him and to learn the history of divine interposition in the individual life of heavenly cooperation in every work for humanity can you imagine sitting with your heavenly angel and asking your angel how did you protect me when i was traveling there what happened when i had that accident how come i did not die how come what did happen your angel would explain to you how earnestly he took care of you at every moment of your life all the things that happened to your life would be brought to your memory what a joy that would be to have fellowship with an angel that has been your guardian for all your life and he won't leave you even in heaven he would be your company what a joy that would be to sit with your angels and get to know every individual part of your life that you have experienced on this earth also from what dangers seen and unseen we have been preserved through the interposition of the angels we shall never know until in the light of eternity we see the providence of god that's what uh, you can get to know what about uh, having fellowship with the faithful of all ages look at what uh, god revealed through ellen white communion with the faithful ones of all ages who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb the sacred ties that bind together the whole family in heaven and earth these help to constitute the happiness of the great redeemer can you imagine i can't wait to get to heaven talk to abraham how on earth could you leave the land of oh just by word god said move and you left everything i can't wait to think meet nova and ask him how did you build that ark when you never saw a boat how were you able to do it how did you preach for such a long time what was your experience in the boat for 40 days and 40 nights i can't i wait to imagine i am um, meet moses and jacob then isaac and david and ask him how he killed goliath i would meet daniel what it would be to what it would be to be in the in the lions den for one night and all lions around you and they did not hurt you i would meet shadrach meshach abednego and ask them what did you how did you feel when you were in the fire didn't you feel the heat what was your experience what was going on in your mind i would meet ellen white what would what was it to receive the visions of god and what was the opposition you would meet i would meet joseph bates i would meet james bates i would meet the pioneers of our church i would meet martin luther i would meet all these faithful soldiers and hear from their mouth what it meant for them and the sacrifices they made i would meet john hurst who was born burnt at stakes and ask him how did he feel when he was being burnt i would meet those people who were torn to death by this uh, inquisition and by people who persecuted them how they were able to stand even though they were cutting their legs and hands chopped off their hair i would meet all the 12 disciples i would ask peter what it means to be crucified ups and down i would meet paul and say what it means to be killed by sword i would meet james the first martyr and ask him what it means to be cut off your head i would meet stephen and ask him how did he feel when they stoned him to death when he was bleeding how How was he able to pray lord forgive them they don't know what they were doing could you imagine my friends eternity is not enough for us to get to know each other and every time you hear a testimony from their mouths all that you have in your mouth is praises unto god most holy worthy worthy is the lamb that was slain that's the kind of fellowship we would experience when we get to heaven also there is no temptation and no sin there is no tree of life knowledge of good and sorry there is no tree of knowledge of good and evil will afford opportunity for temptation why is there why why is there no tree of life or tree of the knowledge of good and evil because there is no place to be tempted there is no place to test your a faithfulness the tree was there to test their obedience there is no need for now because you're already tested and tried because you have proved to be faithful because you obeyed the way of the lord that's why you're in heaven there is no second a test there is no second test of obedience so there is no tempter also in heaven there is no possibility of wrong because all that has been tested and tried and then you have overcome by the blood of jesus and there is no more testing there is no more tempting 
I heard shouts of triumph from the angels and from the redeemed saints, which sounded like 10,000 musical instruments because they were to be no more annoyed and tempted by Satan. And because of the inhabitants of the other worlds were delivered from his presence and his temptations. What about activities? What do we do in heaven? Infinity and beyond. Every power will be developed. Every capability increased. The grandest enterprises will be carried forward. The loftiest aspirations will be reached. The highest ambitions realized. And still, there will arise new heights to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects to call forth the powers of body and mind and soul. What does it mean? Every one of us will reach to the potential that we have been created. Whatever your desires are, whatever your aspirations are, whatever your skills are, we will have an opportunity to put them to work, to put them to work and achieve the best. And I'm not, suppose you say, well, I was an engineer here. I was, I'm a nurse here. I'm a preacher here. So what am I going to do in heaven? My friends, it's not the job that you do here is what God has created you to be. It is not that what that is your skill in heaven whatever the power for whatever the reason god has made you whatever the capabilities he put in you you will be able to reach to the highest what that is i don't know when we get to heaven when you see your life in a different light your aspiration changes your dreams changes your ambitions changes and as they change you will have an opportunity to reach to the maximum for which god has created you however far we may advance in the knowledge of god's wisdom and his power there is ever an infinity beyond. There will not come a day in eternity where you would say, I have known everything because the more you spend time with God, there's much more even to know and to know. So reaching your goals, their immortal minds will study with never failing delight the wonders of creative power, the mysteries of redeeming love. Every faculty will be developed, every capacity increased, the acquirement of knowledge will not weary the mind or exhaust the energies. There the grandest enterprises may be carried forward, the loftiest aspirations reached, the highest ambitions realized, and still there will arise new heights to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects to call forth the powers of mind and soul and body. I want you to know the life in heaven is not will not be an idle life. It is not what you think now. No human mind, ear or heart can comprehend the word of God says. So every day there is something different that makes your life exciting and that gives you the opportunity to reach the highest goals that God has prepared for each one of us. Searching out the treasures of the universe. She also saw all the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's children. With unutterable delight, we shall enter into the joy and the wisdom of unfallen beings. We shall share the treasures gained through ages upon ages spent in contemplation of God's handiwork. Imagine traveling to all the worlds that God has created. Imagine meeting people from all different worlds, sharing with them, understanding them, explaining to them. They are explaining to us what a joyful life that would be. Eternity will not be even enough to understand and comprehend what God has prepared for each one of us. Love increases as time passes by. What does that mean? As time passes by, love also increases. And as the years of eternity roll, they will bring richer and more glorious revelation of God and of Christ. As knowledge is progressive, so will love, reverence, and happiness increase. What does it mean? On earth, after some time, we love fades. People separate. People argue. People fight. Love for one another grows cold, but in heaven, the more time we spend together, the more love grows for each other. The more we are together, the better we understand. Can you imagine what that means? And uh, in, uh, in the interest of time, let me uh, carry on. Everything in heaven is noble and elevated. All seek the interest and happiness of others. What a joy that would be. We are so selfish on this earth. Even the good we do, we do it with a selfish motive right on this earth. But in heaven, everybody seeks the happiness of others. That's where your true happiness is. No one devotes himself to looking out and caring for self. It is this, it is this chief joy of the all holy beings to witness and the joy and happiness of those around them. Communion with the Father and the Son. The people of God are privileged to hold open communion with the Father and the Son. We shall see him face to face without a dimming veil between. 
and uh, a tie never to be broken. Let me, I want you to understand this, this uh, clip. By his life and his death, Christ has achieved even more than recovering from the ruin wrought through sin. It was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man. But in Christ, we become more closely united to God than if we were never fallen. In, in other words, we are in this fallen nature. Once we are saved, we become more closer to God than even Adam and Eve in their unfallen state. What does that mean? In taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. Through the eternal ages, he linked himself with us. You know, when Jesus met Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden before sin, he never had a human form. He was God, and but he was able to converse with Adam and Eve. But now, Jesus is not God himself. He is a human too. The human form that he took, he retains it forever. Therefore, he is even much more closer to us now than when he created Adam and Eve. That's what it means. God has adapted human nature in the person of his son and has carried the same in the highest heaven. In Christ, <clears throat> the family of earth and the family of heaven are bound together. Christ becomes the bridge. He is fully human fully God. Christ glorified in, is our brother. Heaven is enshrined in humanity and humanity is enfolded in the bosom of infinite love. There's only one stain that remains in heaven. Look at what the scripture says. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Revelation 21 1. The fire that consumed the wicked purifies the earth. Every trace of curse is swept away. Everything but there's only one stain that remains forever. And that what is it? Look at what Ellen White says. No, eter no eternally burning hell will keep before the ransomed the fearful consequence of sin. You won't even remember anything, but one reminder always remains. What is that? Our Redeemer will ever bear the marks of his crucifixion upon his wounded hands, his hands, I mean, upon his wounded head, his hands and feet are the only traces of the cruel work that sin has wrought. If there's one reminder of anything from this earth that will remain for eternity, it is the marks of the wounds that Jesus took on his head, on his hands and on his feet as a reminder of how cruel sin was and what great price the Lord has to pay to redeem us. That's the only stain that is left in the earth made new as a constant reminder of the great love that God has shown to each one of you. So the question is, if he should come today, would you be ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to meet the Lord in the air? Be prepared. Jesus is coming. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, begotten son, so that all those who believe in him should not perish. He came down to this earth. He died on the cross. Right now he is in heavenly sanctuary, pleading your case and my case. Soon and very soon, he is coming with the clouds, with the heavenly hosts to take his redeemed home. Will you be a part of them? If that's your desire, there's one thing you need to do. Be prepared because Jesus is coming soon. God bless you all.